So uh, you've heard good reports about last week. My friend Abram was so glad to be with you all. He loved being out here. Uh, Their little congregation in Magnolia is going to be back here this afternoon later on. They take advantage of this space. We're glad to have them here. Laura and I were also really grateful to have some time together. Uh, One of some of our oldest friends, well, let's say longest term friends that we've known. uh, Well, Laura uh, met one during high school years, so many years uh, walking together. Uh, we spent some time with them. He, Dick, recently became an executive director at a, a camp and conference center right on Lake Tahoe. <clears throat> and the day that we arrived, the smoke from the forest fires from Oregon and California blew over and settled right in the, the valley there in the Tahoe Basin, so much so that when we looked across at the beautiful view of the mountains, we had to use our imaginations because it was just white. And every morning, Dick and Colleen said, oh, we so wish you could just see it. If you can imagine, they'd point out the, the line. Well, I, yesterday we did get a glimpse of those mountains, and today it's really clear, just when we landed back again. One of my friends, uh, as we talked this week, said, well, there's a lot of sermon illustrations in there. Something about living by faith, you know. You know, there's, there's stuff that surrounds us, beauty that surrounds us all the time. Sometimes we can only apprehend it by faith, though. Well, we're going to continue looking at the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to press in a little bit further. And we've been talking about, Je- you know, Jesus said that unless his followers' righteousness exceeded that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they would surely not see the kingdom of heaven. And then he, he makes some illustrations, kind of graphic illustrations, really earthy stuff, very human emotions about what does it look like for your righteousness to exceed that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. In verse 21, he said, you've heard it said long ago that you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I say this, Anyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be in subject will be subject to judgment. Just anger of the heart makes you uh, uh, subject to judgment. He says. He moves on. He unpacks this further with today's passage. I'm going to read to you here. It's uh, he kind of spells out what does it really mean to live not just by, by the fullness of the law. What does it look like? So verse 27 of chapter 5 we pick up. Now you've heard it was said that thou should not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at another lustfully has already committed adultery in their heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown to hell. Or if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go to hell. Wow, this is some heavy stuff, gruesome stuff, really. Kind of passage my friends and I in junior high school used to show each other. We it looked like we were studying the Bible in those front pews, but really we were trying to gross each other out. You know, what does this mean? Well, we need to remember this: that Jesus' radical instruction about the fullness of the law with not one jot or tittle being thrown away, not one little dot of an I or cross of a T being uh, discounted until it's all fulfilled. Well, what is he getting at? Well, he's getting at this. Not the fulfillment of the letter of the law, but transformed hearts. Like Sam read to us in Galatians. Those who live by the Spirit are not under the law. That is this. Those whose hearts have been transformed don't need to worry about following an external code. For our righteousness to exceed that of the Pharisees, it means this, really, that the requirements of the law are met, but not by slavish subjection to an external law, but rather by an internal leading of the Spirit that comes from a transformed heart. That's beautiful, isn't it? And Jesus' invitation, invitation to us is this. It's a, it's a dangerous thing. It's a radical thing. And I think it's the most exciting thing. 
Because he doesn't say, here's a program for living with six simple steps. Or here are 12 rules to follow to have a better life. No, he says this. I want to remake you from the inside out. I want your heart to be remodeled and renovated and transformed such that you know the good grace and gift of God, that you're anchored deeply in his love so you know that you belong, so you can move in this world with the sense of confidence that the God who made all of this knows you by name and equips you to participate fully in this exciting world, that he's given us freedom to respond and to do his good will in this world in a way that shapes history, that loves our neighbors, that makes a difference in our communities, in a way we know we belong to one another. In effect, Jesus' project is sort of like that song by Lauren Daigle we just sang, when there are other voices that say we're not enough, when they say that we are weak, when we say that, that says we don't belong. It's a transformation from the inside out that lets that happen. In some ways, Jesus' teaching here is about getting our priorities right. He says, in some ways, you can pay attention to things, even religious things, and get it wrong such that you, you miss out. He starts in this little passage about lustful thoughts. But in some ways, he's talking about not wanting enough. I think that is a, an issue for us. It reminds me of this passage from C.S. Lewis. He writes this. He says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too weak, I'm sorry, not too strong, but rather too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. It's like an ignorant child who wants to go about making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are too easily pleased. How about that? It's almost as God saying, no, I'm not saying that you, are, um, you have too much des- uh, desire and so you look lustfully at one another. He says, rather, you don't have enough desire for the things that really satisfy A a positive take on this same teaching is when Jesus uses the parables of uh, the the fellow who finds a treasure buried in a field and he goes and he sells everything he has so he can buy that field and capture the treasure or a merchant who is on the hunt for precious pearls and when he finds the most beautiful one, he sells everything he has, everything else, takes second place so he can grab hold of that one thing. And in some ways, Jesus is saying this. Don't settle for second best. Don't just muddle your way through life or live in quiet desperation, hoping that somehow things will turn out okay. Or as Lauren Daigle said, your life is the sums of its ups and downs. No, don't settle for that. Move forward and press into this radical, life-giving, reorienting place of belonging and purpose and meaning. Yeah, but that, we have to pause, though, for a minute and ask, but what about this, the gruesome parts of this? You know, Jesus did say, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. You know, Matthew was really uh, taken with that saying of Jesus. He repeats it. Matthew uh, it shows up again in Matthew 18. Jesus says the same, or the same kind of thing comes up in this teaching of Jesus. If your hand or foot causes you to some stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two hand, then feet and suffer hell for that. Or if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Well, you know, that it is pretty gruesome and, and I, but I think this there's the, the tradition of interpreting this is said well Jesus is using hyperbole to show this is what really matters entering the life that God invites us into that's on offer in Christ is what really matters and I think there is some hyperbole here but there, there's more than that 
because the Jewish audience, Matthew was writing for people who were Jewish primarily. And he uses language that they would connect with and meaning that they would connect with. And th th he knows that they would understand that someone who was maimed, someone who was crippled either because of an accident or a birth defect, was not allowed to participate in the offerings of the temple. In fact, uh, let me read to you a passage from Leviticus chapter 21. This is the Lord speaking to Moses. And he says, tell Aaron, Aaron was the first high priest, tell Aaron, for generations to come, none of your descendants who has any defect can come near to offer sacrifices to God. No one who has any defect can come near. No one who is blind or lame or disfigured. No one with a crippled foot or a hand or is hunchbacked or dwarf who has an eye defect can come near to present the offerings. And Jesus knows that they know that. And he's saying this. Hey, you know the, that, the, that the religious tradition you've received that says who's in and who's out, who's acceptable in God's presence and who's not, who's fit to serve God and contribute to his kingdom and, and who isn't. Do you remember that teaching? I'll tell you this. It's better to violate that right out. Maim yourself, blind yourself, cripple yourself if those things get in the way of you accepting this great offer of life that's on offer right now. And that's something I wonder about us. What is it for you as a person? What is it for us as a people that can get in the way, even religious things like this code from Leviticus? What is it that can get, get in our way? And, and for me, I know it's self-protection often. I think all of us have hearts that, you know, we, when we, we grow, we're born into this world, We'd want to be wide open to receive the good gift of life, to know we belong and are loved and can develop competency and skill and do meaningful things and experience beauty and suffer with hope and joy. And then life happens. And we learn that we're not so special. And people can hurt us. And not only is there beauty, but there's some ugly stuff too. And we start to build walls of protection. They come in different forms. For some people, that wall is constant activity. For some people, that wall is being in control of everything so we can keep out what we don't want to see. For some of us, the, the, my, this is a pet one of mine, it's wanting to be right and understand everything exactly, get it right, you know? For some, it's being cute or funny or acceptable or, or, or beautiful. It's all kind of things. We do it also politically. You know, I, I know that pr in my lifetime, there hasn't been a time in public life that's more divisive than now. And I even find myself sometimes thinking of others, how could that, how could someone hold that thought? And I know because I have friends who look back at me and think, how could he hold that thought, you know? The way of trying to, not trust in faith and move with boldness, but pr to protect so we close off others, sometimes whole segments of other people around us. Well, Jesus says this, whatever those things are that you think are protecting you, that are keeping you in line, that are somehow because of your good behavior helping you earn God's good grace, get rid of it because actually that's standing in your way of entering to the fullness of this radical life that comes by a transformed heart in God's spirit. You know, uh, our friend Colleen, who we were with as, uh, out in Nevada, she served for many years as a nurse in, in different capacities and sometimes recently now as a hospice nurse. And I was reminded while we were out there of an article I read by a hospice nurse who wrote a short little piece about the regrets that she hears of her patients in their hospital beds. She says almost every single one of them comes to term with their demise, but they also come with some burdens of regrets. And she wrote in this little essay what her top, the top five were. Listen to some of these. 
I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not what others expected of me. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Isn't that something? And I don't think, that, I don't think these folks are talking just about work, what you do for a paycheck. I think they mean hustling for your self-worth sometimes. Right? Or I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I'd let myself be happier. You know, Jesus, I think, is saying this. Listen, friends, you only get one shot at life. Don't settle for second best. Don't settle for the things that are distractions to quiet down the longings of your heart. Don't settle for those things that satisfy only for a little while. Let me make you new from the inside so you know the power of my spirit the power that unites you together to encounter beauty and meaning and truth and freedom so that when you come to the end, you won't be carrying extra baggage of things that only get in the way when you thought they were about protecting, but actually they were preventing you from engaging with this life. You know, it's not just we do this... This, this kind of purity, you know, uh, one of my favorite uh, philosophers, the Danish guy, Soren Kierkegaard, he said that the purity of heart is to will one thing. Purity of heart is to will one thing. It's not purity of heart is never to have a stray thought or never to look lustfully at another. Or to, he says it's to will the one thing. It's like that merchant who bought the pearl. Cut away everything that keeps you from grabbing the life that Christ calls us to. Mother Teresa says this, I'll close with this quote. To be pure, to remain pure, can only come at a price. And that's the price of knowing God and loving Him to do His will. He will always give us the strength we need to keep purity as something that's beautiful for God because a pure heart is a carrier of God's love. And where there is love, there's unity and joy and peace. In God's wisdom, it might look like foolishness. He has decided to season this world with us. Once we're made anew to be light and salt in this world, A blessing that brings, as Mother Teresa says, love and unity and joy and peace. Boy, what a great journey of transformation. What a great invitation. And what a great privilege to do it together with one another. Let's pray as the band comes forward to lead us in our final closing hymn. Lord God, thank you uh, that you call us that you uh, make us your own, that you have shown us a pearl of great price, that you've shown us a way uh, to belong in this world to you, to your purpose and mission. Thank you, Lord, for one another in the journey together. We pray now for the courage to see and by your grace eliminate those things that keep us from following you wholeheartedly the things that may be easily identified as unhealthful distractions, but even those things too we cling to because we think our life depends on it. Let us find our life in you only because we know that is where abundance lies. And it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. I'd invite you to stand together and pull out your lyric sheet as we join in our final hymn. And I'll tell you what that is. It's the uh, Christ be beside me. I think you'll recognize the tune.